Hello, it is Bible Scribe. Welcome back today. I'm doing an interview today with a lady named Mary. And Mary told me a story about a large part of her life that was dedicated to a religious group, a Christian religious group. And her involvement, her and her husband's involvement with this group turned out to be to their detriment as a family, as a unit for God. Uh, and and so it's it's kind of a sad but a good story in a way because they came out of it. But it's a very interesting study in what can happen within a religious group of any kind, uh, let alone a cult or a, a you know a, a a deceitful practice type of group, any group that demands authority, that demands you follow rules, uh, that demands certain level of conformity to participate, to be a part, to be loved, to be accepted. This is the kind of thing we're going to see in this interview, in this story. So I'll start to tell you now about Mary and her husband and how they got involved with this group and how it affected their lives. And then we'll hear from Mary herself on her experience, not only within the church, but within the church's own seminary that was training her and her husband to become pastors in the organization. So growing up, Mary was a part of a religious family, a Christian Protestant religious family. So she was in churches, mostly non-denominational, but conservative fundamentalist type churches as a young person. Uh, and so she had a, a mother that was very loving and supportive and taught her the practices of Christianity. And so she grew up with that solid foundation of at least understanding Christianity in general and having the practices. Now she does say that uh, as a younger child, she she just kind of went through the motions, you know, uh, as many people do when they're younger, it, it may not be internalized. So as she grew older and then in her teens, specifically at about age 17, she went to a Christian summer camp where she did personally give her life to Christ. She repented of sin. She believed in Christ and confessed that and became what we would call a normal born-again Christian. But it, at this point for her became internal. It became her religion, her relationship to God and to Christ, rather than just through her parents. And she became, as she calls it, on fire for God. And so she was very adamant about living out her faith in God and in Jesus Christ. Whereas before that, she said it was just kind of what they did as a family. She didn't feel like it was her own, but it was just what they did. So it was a practice. But now it was real for her. So in the early 2000s time period, she got married. And she married this gentleman who was in the military. And so as part of that job, you know, any military service member, there's a lot of travel, there's training, there's different things that happen. Well, in the case of her husband, his military assignment took them to the UK. So Mary and her husband pack up, they leave everything they know in the United States, they move over to the UK uh, for his military assignment. And so as he begins his military career, there's a lot of training involved where he goes away and leaves her at home uh, near the base there in the UK, but without knowing anyone because they had left their home in America. So she's at home, she's alone, she's lonely. There's a certain group, a Christian group, that reaches out to Mary in this case. And they give her support. They, they give her uh, friendship, companionship. They get very involved in her life. This group is called the NTCC, or the New Testament Christian Church. And from what I've learned about the group, they do have, uh, they have church plants near a lot of military bases. It's part of their outreach where they reach out and work with people in the military because of just this very reason. There are people that are, are in the military who have spouses that have gone away and all this. So this group reaches out to Mary in the UK and they connect with her. She likes them because they obviously provide care for her. 
from a friendship, a companionship level, even to the point of bringing food and doing meals for her, uh, inviting her into their homes, just generally building a bond of friendship and care and love. So as her husband is away doing trainings, doing his assignment in the military, and she is alone, this group, the NTCC, New Testament Christian Church, the members of this church body near where she lives in the UK start reaching into her life and becoming a part of her life. They become very close. She starts to essentially take on the teachings, uh, the practices of this group. And it's a very, it's a very tight-knit group. It is a very conservative Christian group, uh, very prudent in its, uh, you know, in its policies, in its practices, a very conservative and fundamentalist type uh, of doctrine of Christianity. So as Mary gets involved with this group more and more, some unspoken conformity starts to happen in her life. She starts to dress more like the people in this group sometimes because of hints from other women in the group. Maybe you could dress like this, or they would take her to go shopping and get dresses that were, quote, appropriate according to their group standards. And so this kind of thing happens a lot, where she adopts practices from this group simply because these are her best friends at this point. They are the people reaching into her life, showing her care and love. And so in return, in a response to that, she feels accepted, and she wants to be a part of that group. So she starts to take the practices of this group. And of course, while her husband is away from her, and they are communicating about what's going on with this group, her husband is excited for her because it's a Christian group. They assume that they share the beliefs with this group, and that, uh, you know, in his absence, he's excited that there's a group of people that cares about his wife and is willing to step into her life and help her as she is alone without him while he's away. And as time goes by, the involvement, both with Mary and as her husband comes home, he gets involved too. And so their involvement just grows over time. And then these many unspoken kind of conservative fundamentalist rules start to come into play where they adopt these, quote, unspoken rules, even though they're not told they have to, they do it because they feel connected to all of these people in this church the New Testament Christian church. So they start to dress like them, act like them, do the things that are expected, quote, expected of them. And so as they examine the doctrines that they're being taught out of the Bible, they are Protestant doctrines mainly uh, and, and tend to be very conservative, but almost to an extreme level. Now this to them wasn't totally out of the ordinary, uh, still in line with Mary's Protestant background she had as a child and a young person through her family, but this seemed just a logical step. Uh, the group and the pastor of the group, the NTCC, they taught these different practices, ways of dress, ways of acting, etc., as a part of their path to righteousness and to holiness. That this was just expected of a person seeking God that they would dress in a pure manner do certain things, act a certain way, not be seen doing certain other things. Uh, and we'll talk more about that. You'll hear more about that from Mary herself. But as Mary and her husband got more involved with this group and then told Mary's mother about this involvement, it's interesting that Mary's mother had red flags go off right away. And her mother actually warned her and her husband about getting further involved in this group. So there was some level of warning that came from her mom. However, Mary and her husband didn't heed it because, of course, they felt so accepted and loved by this group and had not at this point felt any significant warning signs for themselves. And so they pretty much ignored the warnings of Mary's mother and continued their involvement with this group. But that wasn't going to stop Mary's mother from being a prayer warrior for both her and her husband during this time in the group. So as the years passed, Mary and her husband both continue to practice with the group, grow stronger in the group and their uh, understanding of all the doctrine and the rules and the way they were supposed to behave. 
and uh, expectation of their future involvement in the group. They wanted to expand their ministry. So one of the ways in the NTCC, or the New Testament Christian Church Organization, that is expected for that to happen is for uh, couples like Mary and her husband to become a pastor and a pastor's wife in a church. And to do that, they were expected to attend the NTCC seminary. Yes, the church organization actually has its own seminary that is dedicated solely to preparing uh, young men and or their spouses to become pastors and pastor's wives. And then to be at the end of their training placed in a church, in an NTCC church somewhere in the world. And so this is what Mary and her husband thought that they should definitely do. It would seem to be the logical next step for them in the organization. And on what was being, of course, told to them was their next step towards being holy and being more Christ-like and being more godly. So they saw it as a natural thing that God wanted them to do and their pastor of the NTCC church wanted them to do. And so they definitely made every effort they could to get into the seminary and they attended together. Now the New Testament Christian Church Seminary is in Graham, Washington, Washington State. And so they prepared and packed up their bags and they moved everything to Graham to attend this seminary for four years. And the interesting thing about the seminary and what's expected of the students is first for married couples, they were not allowed to have but one income and that would could only be through the husband. And Mary and her husband went to this seminary and he was allowed to work, but only him. Then on top of that, the wife is expected to stay home uh, obviously not allowed to work, but then also to stay home, be a homemaker. And then also there were at least three worship services a week on campus that they were expected to attend every single service. In addition to group gatherings where they would go and meet in a home or meet together, all required gatherings. So really what you have is that the seminary absorbs all the time of the individuals for this four-year period and refuses to allow them to earn extra money, expects required tithing and offering of their income. And so the control grip that they seem to have on Mary and her husband's lives was immense and hard to escape. Uh, of course, at this time, they saw this as part of their move towards God. They're, they're growing up in the faith. So they still were on board with everything going on and trying to make the best of it, even though Mary couldn't work any longer. So they were doing their best as a young married couple through all of this to meet the demands of the seminary on both their lives and together and then stay afloat financially so they could continue on through this process and then hopefully fulfill what they thought was the right thing for them in becoming pastors of a New Testament Christian church somewhere in the United States or the world. So with all these burdens placed on them, they're in the middle of their schooling at this New Testament Christian seminary, and that's where we're going to pick up the interview with Mary, where she's talking about the time in this seminary. And I think it's a good place to get you guys into her discussion. Uh, she's going to talk a lot more about what was expected of them, things that happened that were quite shocking to them, and then how over time they slowly started to realize that they were under control as opposed to moving towards God. They were being controlled and manipulated uh, for the purposes of the organization, and that this was not a good thing, in fact, led to a lot of problems for their marriage, for their finances for their relationships in general. So just take a listen to what Mary has to say about this experience from this point forward where they're in the seminary and afterward. One of the things that was odd to me that I, I don't know, we just, it didn't really click that this was a cult. It just didn't. Um, we were taught and preached to that Basically, they act as though they had the market cornered on salvation. So to leave that church, to leave that ministry, especially if God had called you 
to the Bible school, why then would he change his calling? Why then would he send you in another direction? He sent you to this church for a reason. He sent you to this ministry for a reason. You know, why would you doubt God now? Right. You know, that was kind of how it was. Um, for us anyway, it may, may have been different experiences, different things cause different people to leave for different reasons, you know, but we were gung ho all the way. We just wanted to give our lives for God, no matter what it meant. Yeah. Um, and again, the culture of care and community, you know, when you're in it, your relationships outside of that community become strained, um, because you are so involved and wrapped up in what you're doing that you don't have the time to invest in relationships outside of the group and they inevitably fizzle and dry up those other relationships because you ignore them. Um, you know, you don't keep in touch with people. Um, it's, it's looked, okay. If you're having, um, you know, if you're friends with somebody who's not in the church and they're not a Christian or they're not going to your church, then really you're supposed to be soul winning them. Basically, you're supposed to be reaching them for God, you know, and they use this question, the leadership, you can't question what they're doing because they have a, they, they come at you with the scripture of touch, not the Lord's anointed. So the pastor's the, the founders of the group, they're, they're the anointed of God. And to question them is to question God. Wow. So people don't do it. Right. You know, who are you to, to speak up and, and question the man of God who has given his whole life already? You're trying to give your life still. This guy's already given his whole life to God. Who are you to question him? You know, that's kind of the attitude. And because of that, people don't, don't really wise up to what's going on. Um, they just take things in stride. Sure. And part of that is the rules. <laughs> right. And a lot of the rules, a lot of the rules are, are, they'll tell you, like I said, right out in the orientation, they'll tell you, this is not biblical doctrine. This is just group policy. But the thing is, if you're not on board with it, then you can't be a part of their group. And to leave that group is to leave everything because once you're that deep into it, there is nothing else. So you're in the, do you want to say anything more about your, I guess, experience inside the seminary before you got out? Is there anything else to that? Or is it just this yeah. really intense uh, rules? They absorb all your time. They take you to all these events and make you do all these things not optional and you all are going along for the ride is there anything else there before that ended that that you'd want to talk about yeah i'll just real quick touch on some of the rules that they had um you know concerning how we were supposed to behave and you know some of my favorites looking back on it i i have to say uh one of the rules they had was no mixed bathing okay mixed bathing okay. Meaning yeah. Swimming. <laughs> so if you're at the beach, there can't be other men at the beach. Yeah, no, I'll, I'll give you a perfect example. Um, <laughs> so I lived in an apartment complex near the school. A lot of the students lived in this apartment complex. Now, not okay. only students, but mostly. Um, and in fact, we, we joked around, we called it the married dorms because it's where all the married couples lived. It was the closest apartment complex to the church. So a bunch of us lived there. And there was a swimming pool um, and it was one hot summer day, me and several of the sisters, we got together and we went and dipped our feet in the pool. There was nobody there. It was the middle of the day. Okay. And there was nobody there. Um, a few of us got in, we were all fully clothed um, and we even hung up towels <laughs> on the fence around the pool so we could have some sense of privacy. And as soon as another person came to the pool who was not part of our group, we, a lot of us left because we didn't want to spoil our testimonies or whatever. Yeah. Um, but there was no men there. It was just ladies and we were all fully clothed. And that Sunday we were absolutely, well, word had apparently got back to the pastor about this. 
And we were absolutely lambasted from the pulpit about having our focus off of God. You know, we obviously have time for frivolous activities. You know, what kind of a testimony are we sending to the unsaved people in the apartment complex? Um, you know, we must not be focused enough on school, on God. And, um, you know, that was when that happened, and this was a little later in my time there, I felt like that was kind of ridiculous. Yeah. And I was a little bit agitated on the inside about this whole experience. And I just kind of swallowed it and moved on. But that was one of the things that just never really sat right with me. I felt like we did nothing to deserve that. Everyone in the church knew exactly who the pastor was talking about. So it's not like it was some, um, you know, uh, you know, secret private rebuking, right. you know, where they don't know who he's referring to. Everyone knew who was, it, who was there wow. and it was humiliating. It was degrading. And I cried. I thought I'm, you know, first I was ashamed. Then I was angry. <laughs> You know, right. and that's just one of those things that kind of stayed with me. And it was a lot of things like that over the years that they happened. And at the moment, I just kind of let it go. I processed it and let it go. I didn't really fully understand it. But then later, as things began to snowball, we began to um, start to question what we were doing here and question the sincerity of this group. Right. Um, all of these little things that had happened over the years came back and started to build up in my mind as being yeah. red flags that I should have, should have seen. Um, there was another time where, you, well, you had to get permission to leave. You had to get permission to go visit your family you had to get permission to, to do anything really to, you could only, um, you could only fellowship. <laughs> this is crazy. You could only fellowship with one other Married couples, excuse me, sorry, I'm stumbling over my words. Married okay. couples could only fellowship with one other couple unless you had special permission. And you had to get permission to have that fellowship with the one other couple. Wow. Now, okay, now you think that's bad. Listen, so we were married when we came into this group. But the courtship rituals for the singles in the group was like something was like nothing I had ever seen before in my life. And this was something that should have clearly been like red flag behavior. But, you know, again, in our naivete, we just kind of dismissed it away. But basically singles had to get permission from the pastor if they were interested in courting a fellow, you know, brother or sister or brothers had to get permission from the pastor to court a sister. They would then get permission. And during 30 minutes, of fellowship on a Sunday night, they were able to sit on the wall. They called it the wall. It was the courtship wall, basically, where young singles sat on the wall and talked during this fellowship to get to know each other. And mm -hmm. they could not date outside of that. They couldn't, you know, text or call or uh, go on regular dates without a chaperone. And you could only have a chaperone after you've been courting for so long and if you got special permission. Um, and the reason they say they did that was to preserve purity, to preserve the testimony of the, the students and to keep them from engaging in sinful behavior. Hmm. And because of this policy, you know, the sad truth is that this group is full of troubled marriages, young students getting married after, you know, quote unquote, courting for yeah. three months. And they really only spent about 12 hours with the other person. Wow. You know, it's, it's insane. And because of that, a lot of these marriages have a lot of problems. Hmm. And, you know, that's just one of those sort of the darker side of that whole thing. But we weren't really impacted by that. We were already married. So we didn't go through any of that. It was just something we sort of watched from a distance, you know? Um, and, and, oh yeah. Eating with, um, <laughs> my husband's making hand gestures to me. They <laughs> a policy of not a policy, an unwritten rule that 
sort of an expectation that people were supposed to eat their fries with forks. It's, it's stupid. <laughs> but that was a rule, eating it, fries with forks. I wouldn't say it was a hard and fast rule. It was more like an unspoken expectation. It was just everyone did it that way and they looked at you funny if you didn't do it that way, right? And it's like that. It's like that. Yeah. It's it's not a lot of the stuff that people do is stuff that they are made to feel like they should do. Yeah. As opposed to being directly told, you must do this or that. It's just uh, because of that top-down pressure it sounds like, you know. Right. It's unspoken because it it really from an authoritative level it is expected they don't have to speak it because they've already gotten you right did you run across any training while you're in the seminary that was specific to how pastors should act so that that authority structure is passed down does that make sense uh, yes you the whole point of the seminary was to churn out ministers who were all preaching and teaching the same thing. Yeah. We had to be on the same page. We had to present a united front in how we looked, how we acted. You know, um, the training was intense. Um, it was meant to turn you into a soldier for God, you know, in this group that, you know, when, when they sent you out into the field to work in a church, they're expecting that you're going to behave and live and abide by a lot of the things that you learned and uh, by example up in the school. So that when they send their overseers around to all the churches, um, you know, everybody's preaching and teaching the same thing, whether it's in Korea or England or, you know, Mississippi or North Dakota, every mm -hmm. church has the same feel, the same vibe, the same doctrines, the same policies, the same look that's the whole point of the school yeah and i'm sure that that was always explained as so that you know we are a, a pure vessel for god or you know because we are his representatives we have to maintain this level of excellence or something like that right yes absolutely yeah. there we we set ourselves up you know they're really it's about holiness so not, you know, as opposed to holiness being like an inward work, holiness is your outward work. Hmm. What you do, it's how you look, it's what you say, it's how you behave. Um, that's how you achieve holiness, closeness to God is by, you know, and the more you emulate the pastor, the more holy you become, you know, that's kind of the idea. They don't say that directly, but that is the, the implication. And the other thing I wanted to touch on before, you know, moving on is the, the financial burden of the, you know, only men can work, women cannot work. Right. Um, all of the activities. They also have um, twice yearly, they do a conference in Missouri. Now their headquarters is in Graham, their conference, their campground is in Missouri twice a year. And a lot of times the conference would be at Missouri once in a while, it would be at Graham, but usually it was in Missouri and students were also expected to be at this conference every time, twice a year. That's two cross country trips a year on a single income. Um, while you're also paying for Bible school, which was its own burden, you know, and that was a huge financial burden. And if you couldn't make it to conference or if you couldn't, you know, if you missed a church service, you know, the consequence being in Bible school is that you could lose your semester. Hmm. So, you know, at the time, I don't know if prices have changed, but the time it was about $700 for a semester to pay for a semester of school, which is very affordable, you know, very reasonable mm -hmm. compared to other schools. But when you factor in the fact that you can't really work <laughs> uh, any more than the bare minimum and you're always constantly, oh, the tithing, oh my gosh, not only did we have to tithe, but because we had to bring an offering every service. They, they preached, you never come to God empty handed. Hmm. So we offer, they took up an offering every service. They also often took up special offerings for traveling ministers, missionaries, um, which, you know, 
it it it's a hard um financial burden to to maintain especially if you're a young person with you know just living on a single income trying to support your family yeah it was hard enough for us we we're just two people but there were some families trying to support you know all of their kids and everything they have like a give till it hurts type of mentality mm, yeah and you know <laughs> you you can only give so much you know it, it left us with nothing a lot of times and i remember we struggled financially um a lot and there were times where we couldn't make it to conference and you know in order to keep from losing the investment that we had given for our schooling um my husband would uh work for the church as like a security for the campus while mm -hmm. everybody was gone to Missouri and they didn't pay him. They just gave him credit for school. Mm. And, you know, so it's not like it helped us financially. It just kept us from losing our classes. Wow. Um, and I, and I recently found out, um, I didn't know this at the time, but I recently found out that they take up offerings, you know, for missionaries and for their ministers, but then that money, which has been offered up freely from the, the, you know, giving spirit of these people in this church, the money that was offered up freely is then turned around and given to the missionaries and the ministers as a loan, which needs to be repaid back to the main headquarters. Wow. Yeah. And that's why there's no real financial accountability to the church members. Cause it's, <laughs> I mean, they're basically being robbed, you know, and instead With, of taking that offering money and giving it as the offering it was intended to be, right. it's given as a loan, which and, I think is. Yeah. And, and I'm amazed at if everyone in there is giving that much of their income, like, what are they doing with that money? Like, does it go to the <laughs> well, seminary or is it going somewhere else that you don't know? It is going into their pockets. Hmm. <laughs> They live lavishly. There's a huge financial disparity in the leadership and in the church members. Wow. Um, and I actually was reading at one time recently, actually, about how the church really functions. If you read through their bylaws, they function almost more like a real estate corporation um, masquerading as a church because they will front the money for church buildings and, and things to expand the the organization um but all the deeds and everything remains in the church's name wow and the pastors have i mean exquisite lavish mansions that they live in while all of the people are paupers <laughs> you know some of them do better than others but that is the vast majority um they're living the high life you know and and we're struggling to uh give our two dollars in the offering plate because we don't have anything else you know yeah uh it was it was it was a problem and we we struggled uh we had a major financial implosion of our own in 2010 you know this financial burden also puts an enormous strain on marriages of course it, it, forces people into desperate circumstances in order to keep up the appearance that everything is okay. Because if a man can't manage his own financial affairs, then he can't manage a church's affairs. And it looks really bad on you. If you're having a fine, if you're having financial difficulties, like you're failing God in some way. Um, and there is another unspoken rule. And it's one of those things where it's, it's not written down anywhere. And you know, they would deny it if you accuse them of this, but the rule is, that it's not okay to not be okay. You know how some churches have this, hmm. you know, it's okay to not be okay. Bring your burdens here. This is what your church family is for. That's not the case there. There, it is not okay to not be okay. You're not supposed to share your burdens with your brothers and sisters so as to not be a stumbling block to their own walks with God. You know, your burdens may become their burdens and cause them to stumble. Well, you don't want that. So you don't share it with your brothers and sisters. If you're in difficulties, you're supposed to talk to your pastor, but because of the fear of being a failure before God, people are very hesitant to open up about struggles that they're experiencing. Mm. You know, it's like, oh, you're struggling financially. Well, you're, 
you're not managing your money right. And you must not be right with God because he blesses those who are faithful. Right. Oh, you're, you're anxious and depressed. You're stressed. You're overwhelmed. Well, you just don't have enough faith. You know, basically if you had a burden, then you must not have left it with Jesus. You know, struggle equates to shame. And because of this, people often would slap on a happy face for church. That way, no one would think that they weren't right with God. Meanwhile, behind closed doors, people are resorting to desperate measures just to maintain that sort of surface illusion that all was well. And that leads to huge problems. And that's what happened with us. We had, you know, a a huge financial implosion of our own. We, We could not manage under this this oppressive sort of atmosphere and it caused us a lot of problems. Were you still in the seminary when this happened? We were, it was actually the year we graduated Okay. and we were, so this, okay, this is, this is the whole thing all on its own, but basically we, we were struggling financially Yeah. and we were like a couple of weeks away from our graduation and from taking a, um, hopefully what was a position in a church somewhere out in the field. That's the point. You go, you graduate, yep. then you go find a church and make yourself useful for God, you know, and for the group. Right. And we had been praying and feeling like God was calling us back towards, you know, our home. Um, or at least within, you know, spitting distance of home so that, you know, we, we wanted to find a church that was near to where we had come from because we were feeling like our mothers were needing us. They, they had, they were having some health problems Mm. and um, there was some other things happening and we were praying and we really felt strongly like God was calling us back home. Okay. And we went to the group about this and, you know, my husband went before the board because the board makes the decision. The board talks to God about, you know, the calling. (laughs) Okay. And the board told us that God had been, had impressed upon them that we were to go work in a church in which we were trying to come back to like, you know, and that was totally not anything that that's not anything that we were getting, but that's apparently what the board had said. So we prayed on it and we were like, I guess we'll just We'll go where we're needed. You know, it's not about us. It's about the ministry and the mission field. And, you know, we were desperately trying to hang on to this notion of like that we could do it. We could be, we could do all of this and still be a success before God, you know? Yeah. But I look back on it now and I realize God knew, God knew we were about to lose everything. We were on the knife's edge of, of losing everything. And it happened just two weeks later. We had complete financial collapse. We had no more money. We lost our, our, our vehicle and we didn't, my husband lost his job. Um, we couldn't pay the rent. We were going to get evicted. It got to a point where we could no longer hide the shame of our financial failure yeah. Through all of that, God provided a way out. He provided us with a ticket back home <laughs> of all places. We we didn't have the money for a ticket, but God put it on a family member. They 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 put up the money to bring wow. us home. Wow. And we sold everything we owned. We had spent 7 years building a life together. We had to get rid of everything, absolutely everything that we owned. And I could not find a job. My husband couldn't work. He wasn't well. You know, he, he was breaking under the strain of what was required of him. Yeah. So I was trying to step up, but I couldn't get a job without a car. I couldn't get a car without a job. Wow. And now I will say this. So in our moment of crisis, the church was again, they were everything that we needed in that moment. But it wasn't so much the leadership as it was my brothers and sisters in the group. You know, I would go to church and they, they knew we were struggling and they would come and just drop envelopes of money in our lap. You know, here, here's wow. for your electric bill here, you know, go, 
go, go get you some food. People brought groceries, tons of bags of groceries to our house. I mean, they really came together as a, like a family to help us in our time of struggle. And I, I look back and I see this as being manipulation, not on the part of the brethren who were trying to help, right. but on the part of the group, Yeah, just the group in general, go take care of this person who's struggling because we were on the brink of leaving the whole organization because we just couldn't hack it anymore. Yeah. And they didn't want that. They didn't want us going back home. There was no New Testament Christian church in our hometown. So we wouldn't be able to be a part of the group anymore. In the end, there was no other way. We had to leave. And that was the beginning of a separation from the group, but it, it wasn't over yet. We, we left the group. We moved home uh, with my mom. And the church that was up, so we, we lived um, in one place. There was a church about two and a half hours away. The pastor and his wife from that church drove all the way to see us when we were back at home. Mm-hmm. You know, they came and they fellowshiped with us. They gave us that dose of, of like Christian fellowship that we had been missing since we left there. And because our relationships with our family were all strained. So it's not like we were going back to a very happy environment. We, it was all very strained, you know, they were helping us. They were glad to have us back, but you know, we still felt like that's not where we need to be. (laughs) Not in this way. We wanted to go there to serve God, not go there in, in our shame because we, we failed in, in Washington, but like many people in the group, they were sincere people, genuine. Yeah. They loved God. They were serving God with everything they had. And there are a lot of people, I want to make sure I say this, there are a lot of people in that group who are just genuine people who are trying to serve God and they don't understand that they're involved in a manipulative group. Right. Right. They ended up giving us a place to live nearby and offered us a position in their church. So we were able to then come back into the group after a brief respite away from it. We were able to work our way back into the ministry and we thought, oh, this is a rebirth. God is giving us a second chance. We failed him the first time. Now we're going to make him proud the second time. You know, we've been given a new chance. God is good, you know? And That was, but that was sort of the beginning of the end (laughs) Mm. Uh, because once we were pulled away from the group, it's amazing how much clarity you gain Yeah, uh, when you are no longer inundated with it all around you. Yeah. And something began to happen in the group just a little while after we moved to this new church. It was, and when we were in Bible school, they taught and preached against being involved in multi-level marketing schemes Okay. Um, for the purposes of you don't want to, it, it's because of their potential to cause you to look at your fellow brother and sister as a potential dollar sign. Right. They taught against things like Amway sure. and you know, not being involved because your, your ministry should be about God, not about getting that dollar. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. And something began to happen. We started noticing everybody was, you know, drinking this, um, I think it was called Shakeology. Yeah. You know, smoothies. I know about that. Okay. Uh, Beach body, you know. Yep. Uh, this, This started to pervade this group. We started seeing it online. You know, by this time we were now online. You know, internet at one point was not allowed, but you know, times change. You know, they had to roll with the punches. <laughs> so we started seeing people promoting their their you know their beach body and shakeology, posting pictures of of people in swimsuits and athlete, you know, athletic wear. That... And this is people in the church. Yes, yes. And it was in my mind, you know. Um, why are you posting pictures of people dressed so lasciviously? Right. That's, 
that's not a good testimony. You know, <laughs> you don't want to wear a bathing suit because you think it makes you, um, you know, somehow immoral before God, but you'll post a picture of somebody else in a bathing suit. And you're thinking back probably to the time where you and your friends, girlfriends were swimming and got in trouble for swimming without men around for some odd reason. Yes. And I, and I, I, um, I was concerned by this. This did not, this was the first moment, even in spite of all the struggles that we had had, this was actually the first moment where I began to really question what was happening that the first time that I really started to look around and say, this isn't right, you know? Mm. So we thought we're going to, you know, we're going to warn our brethren that, that they're being caught up in something that is not what we were, you know, we were taught not to be involved in this, this, the devil has blinded them. We're, we're going to warn them, Mm. you know? So we made a post. Now it wasn't very aggressive. It was like more of imploring them to hear you. Um, you know, my brethren, you may not even realize this, but this is a multi-level marketing scheme that this is the kind of thing we were taught not to do, you know, be careful with it. Be careful with your ministry. Be careful with your testimony. Well, (laughs) it wasn't taken very well. I can't imagine. (laughs) We made that post and we thought, oh, we're coming from a place of love. We know how easy it is. For things to go wildly off course we had just ex- experienced something like you know something like that and right. um we put out a warning and all of a sudden everyone absolutely everyone came out of the woodwork and started attacking us wow they started saying you don't know what you're talking about you know how dare you speak out against the lord's anointed well apparently pastors were doing this like in the higher ups in the ministry okay. and then they they made it personal they um criticized us for our financial failures and said things to the effect of you probably wish you could be involved in this but you know you'd just get greedy with it and have another financial collapse or something heaven's um, sake it was horrifying. This, these were my family. This was people that I, I were supposed to be, you know, they say they're, you're supposed to be closer than family with your brethren in the church. You're, you're the family of God it's right. closer than your blood family. And I was hurt. We were both deeply hurt by a lot of the things that were said. And we felt like it was rather unfair that we were attacked in this way. And it continued to spread like wildfire in spite of our best efforts to, you know, educate our fellow Christians on, you know, the error of their ways. <laughs> and by that, you mean this, uh, the, the investment in these uh, MLM schemes? Yes, because... So that just went through the whole church, essentially. Oh, it did. So it huh. we the, the pastor and his wife at the church... Uh, that we were at had changed out a few times now. And we had a new young pastor and his wife who were like fresh out of Bible school. We actually went to school with them briefly. Um, And then they came and started running the church as the pastor um, a couple of years after we had already been there. So now we're fast forward. This is like 2013. I found out that they were involved in this, the pastor and his wife uh, at the church. I had a problem with that. Um, because the, the, the church people were already extremely poor (laughs) and it was a very much like an inner city church kind of work. And, you know, I had a problem with them being involved in this. I felt like it set a bad example. I felt like it wasn't what we were taught in Bible school. So I, we, we, my husband and I, we went to the overseer, which is, you know, we tried to start running it up the chain of command, basically like, this is a problem. Can we please address this? Come to find out the overseer is also involved in it. (laughs) So we reached out to the pastor, the president of the Bible school at the time. He was involved in it. He had a huge following, a huge group under him. I'm sure Uh, he did. He, oh yeah. And then So we were like, okay, so we're going to take this all the way to the top and the top being the man who founded the organization. um, It was his right-hand man, basically, who, who helped him 
get this off the ground years ago. And um, we went to this man and he was like, huh, I will definitely look into this and get back to you. And he never did. We called him again. He said, I'm praying about this. Let me, let me do a little more investigating. Never got back to us. Well, this was just left like hanging. Hmm. And that became, that became a major issue for us. Uh, we did not want to have anything to do with this. Yeah. And we thought, you know, this whole group is going in a direction that we don't like. And the way everyone behaved when we started talking about these kinds of things really um, opened our eyes to the reality of how we had been manipulated. Yeah. And we start, I started questioning things. I started um, being curious. Now, just real quick, I'm going to interject years ago when we were in the Bible school, there was a blog that had gone up and they called it the Xer blog, Xers being people who had previously gone to the church and now are ex members, ex ministers. Um, and there was a lot of things written on those websites. I don't know. Some of them may be true. Some of them may not be true. We, ne I never read them in Bible school because they told us not to read them. <laughs> of course, uh, they said it wasn't edifying for the soul. Why would you read stuff like that? You know, you should focus on your own walk with God, not be interested in the gossip of disgruntled former members. But as we were becoming more and more dissatisfied with what we were seeing, I started to remember a lot of things that had happened to us over the years and things started connecting. It, thoughts started connecting, things started clicking internally. And we were like, we need to get out. <laughs> Yeah, it took us over a year to finally make the decision to leave um, because we wrestled with our spirituality. We wrestled with our salvation, yeah. with what we knew uh, we wanted to be right. We didn't whatever we did. We still wanted to be right with God. Yeah. You know, I didn't want to be like these bitter people who leave and go on a rampage about all the things that they hated in the group that I didn't want that to be me. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to get out and preserve my own, my own walk with God, because I felt like I was losing myself. And in fact, I had lost myself. They mold you into, in, they put you in a box and say, this is the only thing that you can be if you really saved. And in the process of trying to attain that, you lose everything about your own individual self that makes you you makes you unique we we decided then that we needed to leave but it took us a long time to to finally have the courage to do it because when you leave you lose everything my husband and i were very involved in the ministry we play instruments and sing we we did basically we carried the entire music ministry of the church for years wow and we were involved up in Graham too. We sang, you know, we sang in the choir. We, we had this, this music ministry, which was super important to us. Yeah. And we did not want to lose it. And for the sake of the church members at the church, you got to understand a lot of this stuff comes from the top down. It's not the people at the bottom. We loved these people. We didn't want to cause them to stumble in their own walks with God by having a falling out. Yeah. So we were trying to be careful, um, but in the end, the only way to do it is to just rip off the Band-Aid. Yeah. Um, and when we finally made that decision, they always preach against people um, who leave as having left God as well. And so we had to really work it out in our own minds that that's not what we were doing. <laughs> yeah. And that was hard to do. <laughs> So, but they, they also preach that the people who leave and, and talk badly about their experiences with them, that they're crossed up with God somehow, they're just bitter. Um, and they're, they're going to reap, you know, what they sow and things like that. And so because of that, a lot of people who leave don't share their testimonies. They don't share their stories of how they were mistreated in the organization. And so a lot of it continues to go unheard. And that is why I decided to actually say their name. I wrestled with this for like 
ever since you asked me if I wanted to do this. Yeah. Because it's possible somebody may see it. And my hope is that if it can help somebody avoid the pitfalls, then I feel like I have a responsibility to do it as opposed to the thinking I had before where it's like, well, if I say anything, then I'm just bitter, you yeah. know? And so if it helps one person avoid falling into this sort of trap, then I'm happy to do that. Wow. Well, I thank you so much for the testimony on this. And I, I do think it's, there's, there's no amount I could put a value on what we're doing. So I, I think that it's just, it's important, like you said. And um, so thank you so much for what you've told me tonight. I, I really appreciate it. I appreciate the opportunity to to share it. I, I've never actually told anybody about our experience because I was one of those people who left and stayed silent. Even though when we left, we lost all of our friends, we lost our ministry, we lost our credibility, we fell out of good standing, I guess you could say, yeah. with the church and with the ministry, and we started over from nothing. But in that, uh, where we thought we had reached the end of something, God actually, um, it was actually the beginning of something. And that, you know, we, when we moved home, <laughs> we ended up adopting two children wow. um, who were in need of a home who needed us. And that was the calling right there. We had been feeling that for years. And it wasn't until we made the decision to leave the church that this fell into our lap and we didn't even see this coming. It just fell into our lap. And I thought, you know, God is amazing. He, this, this has been something that we have been um, feeling. This is what we've been called to, but we didn't know it at the time. You know what yeah. I mean? And it wasn't until we made the decision to move in a different direction that God blessed us and said, you know what, here's a new ministry for you. And they gave us these two amazing kids, you know, that and then so amazing. And I mean, it's so often that God does that as, as soon as you, like you said, you kind of realize something's wrong and you make this huge change for him, you remove something out of your life. That's totally wrong. He immediately shows you that you did the right thing by giving you a new responsibility. And in what you're telling me about adopting children, to me, that's one of the most close things to what God does of anything yeah. we can do on earth. So I applaud you in that. I'm really happy for you too. If if we had never left them, this may not have happened for us. Yeah. You know, one of the things I, I didn't really touch on this, but one of the things people do in the group is they put off having children um, in order to get through Bible school, wow. they put off having children in case they're called to a serviceman's work, which serviceman's work requires a couple with no children because of the way the nature of their ministry with the military members and things like that. It's just easier if they have a couple that doesn't have children, you know, traveling and all that. So a lot of people put off children for that. And then, and, and we did that as well. We put off having children and then when it came time that we wanted children, we found that we couldn't have any, but, you know, look how God took something that was, you know, meant to, to hurt us and turned around and use it as something that was amazing, you know, and the reason I know now is the reason we weren't ever able to have children of our own was because there was already two children in the world that were going to need us. <laughs> you know, when we, when they came to us, they were, they were six and seven. So they were already alive and in the world. They wow. needed us. We just didn't know about it at the time. While you were going through all of that, he was preparing them for you. <laughs> was. And they literally came to us the Amazing. day after my birthday, three months after we left the church. Wow. It was, it, I always say it was the best birthday gift I ever received. <laughs> Too cool. Well, okay. um, that's an amazing testimony. I, I definitely will get this online for the sake of those that are still in in the group or that you know are in groups that are similar i think there's there's so many times during your testimony where i, I was you know thinking of so many things that i could have interjected with about 
the way cults operate and and all this stuff but uh, your testimony is really well taken and I, I just really appreciate your willingness to give it i think it's it's groundbreaking in a lot of ways so thank you so much for your your faithfulness in that i'm grateful to you for giving me um the ability to share it uh like i said i never shared it before and i hope that it will bless somebody or help somebody to see that you know there are people out there who have these experiences that they're not alone that that you know there is life after a cult (laughs) there is there is joy and blessings and um god is still faithful you know even after the the hardships of being in a group like that that there can still be life and you know amazing blessings after you're out i you know we we don't currently have a church um we have struggled to find a church home since the since our experience with NCC. Yeah. Um, we would go to churches for a while and then I would see things and I'd be like, nope, out. You know, <laughs> I'm not putting up with any of this. I'm not giving any yeah. control. Because I, I look back and I see how much control of my life I had given up to somebody else. And I never want to put myself in that position again. Yeah. And so And when I had my awakening in 2020, you know, there was a process, you know, it took me a while to really unravel and get to the point where I was coming to your live streams. (laughs) It took me a while to get there. Yeah. But um, my initial awakening happened all at once. I was a changed person. I feel like God was doing something. He was, he was opening my eyes. So I hope that you can understand from Mary's testimony. Now, sometimes the things that, as I listened to this and walked through this interview with Mary, I, I heard a lot of, of pain that came about because the organization was so stringent and strict with what they were allowing people to do, as if there was only one way for people to move towards God in this organization. That has to make you wonder, you know, was this forward momentum that the church was encouraging, was it for the benefit of the people in the organization? Or was it actually for the benefit of the organization at the expense of the people? It seems like from a a monetary financial standpoint, it was at the expense of the members that the organization existed. It also feels like from a uh, uh, just a human effort standpoint, that the organization took advantage of the efforts of the members for the betterment of the organization instead of the betterment of the kingdom of God. There just seemed to be a lot of contradictions as time went on. And interesting thing about this organization is that when you examine their bylaws, and this is actually available on their website today, the New Testament Christian Church's bylaws have all sorts of things in them about titles to the land that their churches are on and deeds to the buildings and land. Everything that the New Testament Christian Church does is owned and controlled by the New Testament Christian Church. So here are the bylaws of the New Testament Christian Church online. As you can see, one of their goals in their bylaws is to promote and maintain churches and missions of the United States and foreign lands. They promote freedom of worship, but only within the limits of their own statement of faith and doctrine. One of the main goals is to establish and maintain Bible and training schools, similar to what Mary and her husband attended They have a goal to own and operate printing and publishing plants. They have a goal to buy, rent, or acquire real estate and properties. 
they have a stated goal to borrow money to purchase real estate properties owned completely by the New Testament Christian Church. They also, interestingly enough, have a stated goal not to engage in any kind of for-profit business, which seems to be contradictory to what Mary said about many of the members' engagement in multi-tier marketing campaigns. The board of the NTC serves as the spiritual authority for the church, period. It says in point B that the board is the final authority for the interpretation of scripture, doctrine, and the theology for the New Testament Christian church. This should be a red flag to every person in the organization, that the church considers itself to be the final authority. Which member in the church is the final authority? Do all the members of the board agree on the interpretation of scripture? This should be a red flag from the start. And of course, lawsuits between believers are prohibited, particularly lawsuits against the NTCC itself. And of particular note in the discipline section of the bylaws, You'll note that in point D, a court of inquiry established by the church itself is supposed to be the arbiter of all disagreements within the church. This is the tactic of a organization that wants to keep control, tight control. It reminds me a lot of the Scientology organization that uh, really has a stranglehold on its membership and any dissension is either stamped out or arbitered against, and they keep the bylaws as such so that when you agree to them, you agree to see them as the arbiter of any disagreement that you have with the church. So you have to ask yourself, is again this heightened level of tightly gripped control over everything the church does, is that for the betterment of the organization of the NTCC, or is it for the benefit of the people in membership for the NTCC? Are they growing people truly for God, taking advantage of individual talents and the, the various gifts that God gives people to move within the body of Christ around the world and do things? Or are they fitting everybody into a mold that fits the purposes of their own organization specifically? It seems to me in my experience that the kingdom of God is a little more fluid than that. And not everybody fits into the same mold within the church of God, within the body of Christ. I hope you got a lot out of this interview with Mary. I had a blast doing it. It was a pleasure to talk with Mary about this experience in her life, a large portion of her life that was wrapped up in this, and how God turned that around for good in the end for her and for her husband and their children. So I hope you've enjoyed this, but please be aware that organizations out there like this may not always be looking out for the best interests of their membership. From the top level, the leadership down, any organization we should be skeptical of because any organization builds levers of control. And levers of control like that are easily corrupted. And I think in the case of the NTCC, whether it started out in this way, in this fashion, for this reason or not, it has become corrupt. And I think you can see that through what they did to Mary and her husband. And if you go online, there's lots of other testimonies about people that were in the church and have left the church and testified to the exact same thing. 
Thank you for your time and listening to this interview. And I hope that if you or someone you know is involved with a group like this, that you can speak truth into their lives, encourage them to seek God first on their own without the help of a leader, without the help of a pastor. The Bible is in plain English. We all can read it for ourselves. We don't need a pastor or a bishop or anyone like that telling us what it says. It's in plain English. Anyone beyond fifth grade reading level can understand the Bible. So please be aware that organizations like this exist, and please reach out to those around you who may be involved in such organizations. God bless.